Catching up with NJ Today's Mike Schneider, up next on Carpe Diem. Hello and welcome to Carpe Diem. I'm Merrill Brown, the director of the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. For the past two years, NJTV's NJ Today has called the television studios at our university their home. Joining me today is managing editor and anchor for NJ Today, Mike Schneider, an award-winning journalist with over three decades of reporting for local and national outlets, including Good Morning America, Bloomberg TV, and currently NJTV's NJ Today. Since joining the NJTV team back in 2011, Schneider has covered a wide variety of topics ranging from the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy to New Jersey politics, including this past summer's senatorial debate. Thank you, Mike, for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure it, to be here. Great to have you. Uh, and it's great to have you on campus as well. <laughs> well it's not, not, you know, one of the great things about being able to be here is it takes you to a whole different realm of when you're coming to work. Instead of being locked into the isolated television station in the, in the skyscraper or the campus someplace else, you know, corporate campus, it's a chance to really interact with the world and, and see a cross-section of people in a way that I've never been able to do before. Couldn't agree more. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's talk about NJTV, first of all. You have significant challenges. It's a startup in many ways. What are the goals of NJTV, and how are you doing over these early couple of years? Well, the goal, as stated by Neil Shapiro, our, uh, our boss at the parent organization, was to create a newscast, essentially, for the state of New Jersey that, that was by, uh, of and by and for the people of this state, and to broadcast in a way that never really was, was covered before, in, in a way that never really was covered before. The predecessor organization certainly did a, did a great job of, tr of trying to do as much as it could, as far as it could, but New Jersey still has a very, you know, bifurcated kind of uh, attitude about itself in many cases, where, you know, if you go north of 195, people are wearing Yankee caps in South, they're Philly caps. Now, I grew up in New York, and, and I grew up in Philadelphia, and I spent most of my professional career working and living in New Jersey, so to me, it was, it was a natural to be able to try to cover both parts of the state because both of them essentially are home to me. And our goal was, is, and remains finding the common themes, finding the common issues, and discussing them in a way that, that is important and germane and, and appreciated by the viewers throughout the entire state, be it from Alpine to Cape May. And how do you assess those two years? Uh, I, with great satisfaction. You know, we started out with very limited resources, with no place to call home. You know, we were at Lincoln Center Studios to begin with, which is a wonderful place, but it wasn't here. And, and coming over here and getting ourselves situated and getting our footprint here, and then being able to start casting our net throughout the state, that certainly was, was very satisfying to see the growth. But then also to have this extraordinary um, pleasure and, and, and uh, challenge of having to deal with, with profound issues. You know, the, the extraordinary politics of this state with two of the biggest political players in the country, Governor Christie and, and Mayor Booker, in this state, you know, the kind of people that we have to cover every day because they're making news every day, and also to have on top of that issues uh, such as, the, you know, we, we went on the air and, and uh, Tropical Storm uh, could, was, was a matter of, of one or, Irene was one or two weeks after we, we started. And then a year later we end up with the hurricane, and then we have this extraordinary fire in Seaside, I mean, from a spot news event, you, you can't get much bigger. And, and national stories, uh, they are as well as local stories. So for a startup organization, uh, it, was, it was everything you, you could want in terms of news and everything you wouldn't want in terms of being a citizen of the state to have to deal with those challenges. But from a newscaster standpoint, it's extraordinary because it really does give you the opportunity to show what you're capable of doing, but also a reminder of what you need to be doing. And how do you think you'll measure success in several more years when the brand is more established and the program is even more widely watched than it is today? Uh, it's a relative term. I mean, you know, from the commercial broadcasting world that you and I came out of, success was what uh, the ratings said every morning. It, it's different here. What it, what it is here is a matter of, of success that comes from having your own standards 
and knowing that you're meeting and, and exceeding your own standards for excellence, for, for knowing that you want to go out and cover the news, and, and being able to say at the end of the day, we did that well. How do you look at Governor Christie and your coverage of him over the next couple of years in the context of the fact that he's obviously a national figure and is a likely presidential aspirant, if not necessarily the likely nominee? It is, well, first of all, we have to suppose that he does win re-election against Senator Bono. The polls say that's a likely scenario, but we won't know until Election Day, of course. Uh, should he do that and win by a substantial margin, there's no doubt that he is positioned to run if he chooses to run. From our standpoint, you know, there are very few public broadcasting stations that have a Monday through Friday newscast. There are very few that have a newscast and have to cover an entire state. And there are very few that have those two things and then have to cover a figure like Governor Christie. I, I'm not quite sure how we will do it. I mean, this is something that we've had in recent uh, days conversations about. What, what do we do? What can we afford to do? Because this is not a matter of, you know, putting a, a reporter and a film crew uh, on the plane or in the car with them, it's expensive to do that. And a lot of the network news divisions, as you and I well know, have cut back extraordinarily too. Some big TV stations around this country that used to have designated political reporters or political units have gotten rid of those. So in many ways, what we're being called upon to do is to step up in the completely opposite direction of where most broadcast operations are going. So for us, we know what we need to do. We need to cover this guy as he goes to the next level if he chooses to. How we, how we do it and how we can afford to do that remain to be determined. And as an analyst of such things, how do you assess his candidacy for president and the likelihood of him being a nominee? Uh, from, a, from an analytical standpoint, I mean, he's, he has positioned himself extraordinarily well. He, if he chooses to run, he will represent a wing of the party that has been written off by many in recent years. Uh, he will be viewed as a unifying and divisive figure uh, within his own party and without the own party. If you take a look at the polls in this state, you know, obviously Republicans are breaking enormously uh, for him against Senator Bono. Uh, he, he's doing okay with Democrats, too. You can see in the number of elected officials, Democratic officials who've endorsed him. The number of independents in the state who have gone for him is very, very substantial as well. If he carries that over, his biggest challenge, of course, will be can he actually win the Republican nomination. After that, it depends who he runs against, but, you know, should he end up running against Hillary Clinton, well, it's going to be a fascinating time. Do you think his candidacy for, at least in the Republican uh, primary season, is a sure thing? In other words, is he certain to run? I would say if he wins the uh, gubernatorial campaign by the figures that he hopes to, uh, by 20 points or something like that, there's almost no way you, you could stop him from running. I think he was, he, there were substantial people in the Republican Party who wanted him to run last time. He could have run last time. He would have had the money to run last time. All those things will be there for him again, if he chooses. We could talk about Governor Christie for hours, probably. And just mm. one more question, and then we'll move on to other topics. What is it really like covering him? His relationship with the media is, shall we say, uneven. Uh, the media loves him in many reasons, for many reasons, because he's quotable, he's an interesting character, and of course he's a national figure, but he's really challenging to cover, isn't he? Uh, most good politicians are, because they know how to present what they want to present when they want to present it. And they have, you know, there, there's, I, I've been fortunate enough to have covered, I mean, virtually every president back to Jerry Ford. So I've had a chance to see, you know, presidents at work, and I've had a chance to see a lot of governors at work and things like that. But there are very few political figures who have the ability to both um, attract a, a really strong following of, of core believers but also charm even those who might disbelieve with him and attract those who might completely disagree with him because of some part of their personal chemistry, of their ability to articulate things. And Chris Christie is one of those rare guys that has all of those skills. Whether that would make him a great president, I mean, that's for somebody else to determine. But the fact of the matter is it does make him potentially a great candidate. Do you have, do reporters have access to Governor Christie in ways that are satisfying? Or? Uh, you know, like, like everybody that you cover in a position of that magnitude, satisfying is once again a relative term. Right. <clears throat> He's frequently available for, um, for news stories. Uh, if he's going somewhere, it's, it's a public, uh, the press is invited in. Does it mean you have access to him? Not necessarily. And he's very keen on saying, if you try to throw a question at him while he's walking to or from the car after an event, He'll say, no access means no access. You know, he has no, he's not shy about letting you know that. 
you know, in the, I had one extended sit down with him and I found him to be very open, very uh, responsive to direct questions. He's got that kind of keen brain of, a, of an outstanding attorney as well. He knows how to take a question, or uh, politicians do this very well as well. He knows how to take a question and turn it to his advantage at the drop of a hat, but he also can look you in the eye and tell you what he believes and have you say, hmm, that's what this guy really believes. You've worked in Florida, you've worked in local news in New York, you've worked mm -hmm. in national news, obviously. Translate that experience to covering New Jersey and the nature of the comparative challenges. Uh, well, I mean, part of what we do here is, it, in a way, you know, we're, we're a series of TV stations. We're a mini network unto ourselves. So, and we were talking about before how you do have a state here that is kind of like two separate, not kind of like, it is. It's part of two separate huge television markets. So you have uh, a profound challenge in trying to determine what story that happens in North Jersey would the people of South Jersey actually give a darn about, or vice versa. So that presents a challenge unlike most other places that I work when I worked in local news. But once again, what we discussed earlier, there have been so many things in the state happening of, of national import that it's not, it's not challenging to show how, how real estate taxes are uh, a big story whether you live in the North or the South. It's not challenging to see how marriage uh, equality issues might pertain to the north or the south. It's not challenging at all to show how a fire down the shore or a hurricane down the shore uh, impacts north and the south. So that kind of, are the, those overarching theme stories make it, you know, on some level easier to cover the state. But if you, if you start to look about, you know, if there's a fight over whether or not the Bergen County police and sheriff should be merged, how do I make that interesting to somebody who lives in Cumberland County? That, that becomes a little more challenging because if you're just, if you're just covering one part of the state, it's something else. So, so in a way, to answer your question about, the, from a local news standpoint, it's more challenging. It, uh, it does kind of take me back to my network experience where I can say, all right, how do you cover something that happened in Illinois for ABC or NBC and make somebody in not only Missouri but in Massachusetts care about that? And that's just good journalism. That's taking an event or an individual and, and telling that story about that event or individual in a way that draws in a, a listener or a viewer or a reader. Another one of the challenges of New Jersey, obviously, is, a, is its extraordinary diversity. It is an amazing state in that regard. And if you look at, you know, urban uh, northern New Jersey and you look at pockets of southern New Jersey and the ethnic, religious, international diversity of it, that's a large challenge as well and an enormous responsibility in many ways. It's hard to get to some of those stories. What's it like dealing with the complexity of the demographics of New Jersey? It's uh, actually, to me, I always look at it as an advantage. I mean, I, I, like I said, I was a kid. I grew up in, in New York. And then I moved when I was in high school and went to college in Philly. I mean, these are very diverse areas. I, and then I worked later on in Miami, you know, talk about diversity. To me, the idea of, of having diversity is not a challenge so much as it's an opportunity. Because suddenly if there is uh, the Arab Spring and you have you know, the overthrow of the government, whether you want to call it a coup or not, that's up to you. In Egypt, we have a large Egyptian community. You have this th situation in Syria, civil war, or not according to the Syrian government. We have a Syrian community in this state. And not only that, we have a Syrian community comprised both of, of uh, Muslims and of uh, Christians. And we have e enormously different viewpoints on what they see as the possible solution to what's going on over there. So to me, that's an open door to actually have more interesting things to cover and have more things to cover as well. I, I view it as, a, as an opportunity. If you live in a place that doesn't have that kind of diversity, I think that becomes more of a challenge. Uh, that, is a, that applies both to urban, to rural, to north, oh, yeah. to south. Do you yourself and do the NJTV teams get into those communities as frequently as perhaps they ought to or that you might like them to? As frequently as they ought to or like to, probably not, because once again, you can't be everywhere all the time, and right. especially in a public television environment where limitations, financial limitations restrict the number of crews you have, the number of reporters you have. But I think if you compare and contrast us to the... Uh, the big stations, the O&Os in New York or Philadelphia, you'll find that we probably get into more of them more often, especially in New Jersey, than they do. And certainly, I think we, we look for the, the more complex issues. You know, I, I, I've been a critic of local news since I was working in local news. 
because the what's what's happened is it has morphed into, you know, I turned on the news last night, and don't get me wrong, there are wonderful people working in these operations who would like to do the right thing all the time, but it's much cheaper to send a camera out or to buy video of, of, a, of a fire, of a routine fire or a traffic accident or something like that than it is to go cover complex issues. The viewers will be attracted like moths to the flame, pardon the metaphor. Or to so that. we're told. Yeah, well, I, well, yeah, but the numbers, the numbers, right now bear that out, but you may be right, because I, and that goes into my other part of my philosophy about this, is that they've polluted their own water, they've driven their own viewers away, because people say, why do I need to watch that? What does that really mean to me? You know, we cover crime at NJTV uh, as an issue, uh, more than a, a series of events. If, if it's a horrible crime, of course, you know, we, we consider that for our coverage, but most of the time, if, if we're gonna talk about murders, we're gonna talk about the problem with murders, uh, record uh, setting numbers of murders in Camden or in Trenton or place or Newark or Patterson, and talk about the the uh, what the police are doing about it. Why is it? Is it a matter of too many guns in the streets? Where are the guns coming? Does the state need more gun control laws? Is it not gun control laws? It has, does it have something to do with our our judicial system? I mean, we're going to cover it from that aspect as well. And I think the other stations don't dip into some of the areas and don't go to some of the places because, you know, then you have to have a reporter out there for several days working on a story, and it's much easier to send somebody down to the West Side Highway to cover a motorcycle uh, mob or something like that. One of the ways that obviously NJTV and all television broadcasters are interacting with their publics these days is through digital media and social media, very important NJTV. How do you look at the relationship between the broadcast and how you interact with audiences through the web? Uh, try to make it as seamless as possible. You know, it's I, uh, no secret, I was in the business a long time before any of that existed. So to me, I, I'm still learning, and my learning curve, I hope, is as quick as it can be. But there are young people out there right now who, have, who know this, you know, like the back of the hand, and, and to them it comes completely natural. To me, though, I have a big belief that I think a lot of people are making a very serious mistake if they think that, that, that new media has supplanted old media, that everything has to be online, and that it's all digital, and that television news uh, doesn't matter anymore. You know, I think we see from, from, you know, the events we were talking about earlier to, you know, the bombing at the Boston Marathon, when, when things happen, people get driven from Twitter or, or from the web to the television as well. And, and television has been redefined as well. I don't care if you're sitting watching on your computer, on your cell phone, on your smart, uh, on a tablet or whatever. To me, if you're watching somebody tell a story from someplace it's television. It's, it's just a, a redefinition of it. The way you're consuming it, you know, when I was a kid growing up, we watched on small little television sets, not as small as some of the ones in the museum here, but relatively small. Now, you know, you got them the size of some of the backdrops here as well. But also handheld as well, and so hand, back right. to the future a little bit, it, right? Absolutely. So, you know, it's, it's a question, and that, uh, from a production standpoint, that creates a whole series of dilemmas. How do you shoot something so it's going to be, you know, visible and accessible and meaningful to somebody who's watching it that way, or to somebody who can sit in a living room and, and have an entire wall occupied by images and, and pictures flying by. It's, it's to me, the challenge is, is to make it seamless, to, to erase whatever artificial boundaries that we have contrived to create in our own minds and to make them one and the same. Let's talk about the national news landscape for a moment. Mm -hmm. You worked at Fox News, albeit relatively briefly in the, years. Yeah. In, the, in the cable era. Yeah, just well, I actually worked there before cable. Right, and you left just as the cable uh, era was beginning for Fox. Um, MSNBC, Fox, CNN, that competition, the nature of the ideological nature, if you will, of the news today, uh, that conflict that exists. How do you look at all that? Uh, not happily. Because, it's, because, you know, we were offered the promise of all news on cable television. CNN is going to be all news. And then MS, you know, this wonderful bond between NBC and Microsoft. And then Fox. I was there at the birth of Fox. I was hired on before Roger Ailes became the boss at Fox. Uh, and I was hired on. They had offered me. I had left NBC about five months before. I was trying to figure out what to do for the next few years. And I was offered the uh, job of White House correspondent for the Fox television station group. And I didn't want to move to D.C. So they offered me instead. They said, what else would you like to do? I said, I'd like to cover the, the presidential campaign. I'd, I'd do that. So. I was there covering the presidential campaign as Roger Ailes was this hired This is 1996, on. right? This is 95 going into 96, right. And so that's when Roger was hired by Rupert Murdoch, and that's when the idea for Fox News Channel, you know, was made public. And they had this extraordinary, 
we talk about a fast startup, but we were on the air by October, and I went from being the national political correspondent to anchoring something that was called the Schneider Report at the time, which later became the Fox Report, which Shepard Smith, after I left, Paul Azan, my old partner from ABC, did for a while, and then Shepard Smith did for a bunch of years and did very, very well. That show's now been, not canceled, but Shep is now their, their breaking news anchor during the evening and uh, anchoring his regular news show during the day, and he does a hell of a job. Uh, I, I have a lot of respect for Shep. Uh, but you don't find, if, you, if you're sitting at home 7.30 most nights and you want to watch the news, you know, on the all news cable channels, uh, it's not there on Fox. It's not there on CNN. It's not there on MS. It's a bunch of talking heads, people yelling and arguing and screaming at each other. Don't get me wrong. That's fine. I like to see intelligent debate shows, too, to the extent that they exist. But there's no, you know, it's, what we've done right now is that we throw a smattering of news throughout the day at people. Then we step back and we just bring people in to argue about it. And they're not even, in many cases, interviewing the newsmakers. What they're doing is they're interviewing people who may have something to say or yell about, about the news. And I don't know that it necessarily helps the public discourse at all. So you don't like the tenor of it. What about the ideology of it? We have, obviously, Fox on the right, CNN somewhere in the middle, MSNBC on the left. How does all that strike you as both a consumer and a news professional? I realize we're on a college campus, but can I say this? It's a four-letter word, but it's not a bad one. Actually, it's a five-letter word. It sucks. Okay. And, and I'll tell you why it sucks. Uh, and, I, and I apologize if I offend anybody, but let's just cut to it. Because it doesn't... It doesn't fulfill our mandate. It doesn't, it, it, it takes everything that we're supposed to be about away. Is there bias in media? No doubt there's bias in media. Was there bias in media before Roger Ailes started Fox News? Certainly there was. Most of it though was, you know, in the Catholic Church they talk about, and not that I'm a Catholic, but I've, I hear from my Catholic friends, sins of omission and sins of commission. You know, if somebody is, is, is making a journalistic sin, uh, by being biased. It should be pointed out. It should be discussed. It should be worked upon. It should be brought to our attention. We should try to be better. But if somebody's going out to fulfill a philosophical or ideological mandate and they're masquerading as a news person, that sucks. So that's the cable universe. What do you think about the broadcast universe, which obviously you were also deeply involved in, and the current balance of power, if you will, between CBS, Fox, NBC, and ABC? I am, I am delighted to see that my old friend Brian Williams is still doing a great job at NBC. I am delighted to see that Scott Pelley is doing an outstanding job at, at CBS. I am delighted to see that Diane Sawyer still retains, well, I shouldn't say that, you know, because I'm not, let's be honest. ABC's not what it was. I worked at ABC when Peter Jennings worked at ABC. I sat at Peter's desk to do reports in the, in the morning when I was covering breaking news like the fall of the Berlin Wall, which happened on my shift or the Iraq War. Peter sat at my desk, which was his desk, but for those few hours, I could call it my desk. I saw a master at work. I saw somebody who was dedicated to the principle of covering international news and did not have an ideological bent about it. He wanted to tell the story of what was going on in the world that day. That's why they called it World News Tonight. And after Peter left, uh, you know, ultimately my good friend, my pal Charlie Gibson, got the job as well. These are, these are guys who I, who I respected enormously. For, for what they brought to the job that they do. I have tremendous respect for Brian and Scott as well, and for Diane, too. I just don't think that ABC is anywhere near the ABC that it was uh, 20 years ago. They, uh, you know, GMA is now number one in the ratings again for the first time since, uh, since, almost since shortly after I left. Right. Right. Uh, and it has very little to do with me, but a lot to do with, you know, the trends that go with morning television. But the fact of the matter is, is that, is that the... Uh, I think CBS, and they've done a wonderful job, I think, in the morning show, too, with, uh, with Charlie Rose, uh, going back to a harder news approach. I, I, don't, I think we severely underestimate the intelligence of the American public if we don't give them uh, an old-fashioned, traditional, here's a half hour of news, take it. If you don't want to think about it after the end of the day, fine, but this is the best we can do right now. Having said all of that, I still think BBC does a better job. Uh, uh, really, that's an interesting yeah. observation. You watch BBC, yeah. you admire what they do. Why is that? Because because the nature of international coverage. Because they actually put people out in the field where they're talking about, you know, people who are are in bureaus around the world, people who are informed, people who in many cases actually speak the language. Ooh, what a novel concept! Instead of having somebody in London re narrate a, a voiceover that somebody else's reporting has done from some other place, yeah, that's that. It sucks. 
That's not journalism. That's just repackaging stuff. BBC, at least, is out there in the field reporting. And that's what uh, I think the American networks need to do more of that, even though they're still doing better than cable is. And I think, and, and cable, you know, t daytime CNN, I think, is still, is still there. But, you know, I think, they've, I think they've, they've given up the ship when it comes to the nighttime. I think that they spend far too much time delving also into And into if talk. Jeff Zucker, the CEO of CNN, handed you the keys to the kingdom, what would you do with those keys? If you knew my history with Jeff Zucker, you wouldn't even raise that question. <laughs> okay, but let's say he did. Things change and he did. What uh, would you I, do with CNN? Everybody's asking that question in television. I, I think I would recognize the fact that they were making a lot of money before they decided they had to make a lot of changes. You know, it's, I can't be locked into the old past where I say everything was perfect, we shouldn't make changes. We should incorporate all the new technology. We can use it intelligently. But the idea that people are, are not interested in news is nonsense. And the idea, it, and this goes back to when I was, when I, was I, I told you at the beginning that I've been complaining about news since I was in the beginning of news. Partially it's just temperament, but partially I think I have a legitimate beef. In, when I started this business, TV stations under the FCC, uh, you could only own five. TV stations and five AM stations and five FM radio stations, any one company in those days. The rules of five, which became the rules of seven. Now it's like I think you can own as many as you could possibly get into your, into your uh, you know, uh, briefcase as long as you don't exceed 40 percent, 39 or 40 percent of the American public uh, because they don't want concentration of power. They've already given up on that. There is too much concentration of power. And what's happened on top of the concentration of power is that these commercial entities, which are publicly traded, don't have a sense of we have to make sure our newscasts actually provide a purpose. What, we have to, what they do is essentially they say we have to make sure that our shareholders are recompensated at the appropriate rate every quarter. That's part of the challenge for sure. You don't have shareholders, you have the public, and mm. doing a great job trying to make that work for NGTV. Was I too pontifical there? No, you were Mike. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Though. If you would like more information about NJTV or Carpe Diem, you can write us at the email address on your screen, carpe diem at mail.montclair.edu, or call us at 973-655-5158. For Carpe Diem, I'm Merrill Brown. Thanks for watching.